For our penultimate speech this evening, I'm thrilled to introduce our new initiative, Speakers in Conversation, which is launching for the first time this year. We are now joined by two women who can offer valuable insights on the Generation Equality campaign. It's a pleasure to welcome Fumzile Malambo Nguka, United Nations Under Secretary General and, Exec and Executive Director of, U of UN Women. Ms. Malambo Nguka, who received her doctorate from Warwick University, has dedicated her career to campaigning for equality, human rights, and social justice, an active participator in the struggle to end apartheid in South Africa. She was also a member of, par uh, member of parliament of South Africa's first democratic government and later served as first female deputy president of South Africa. I'm equally thrilled to introduce Tanzila Khan, Pakistani author, life skills trainer, entrepreneur and founder of Girly Things, a disability friendly mobile application which delivers urgent menstrual products to women anywhere in public. Ms Khan has launched an NGO, Creative Alley, as well as her own company, I Wish. She wrote her first book, A Story of Mexico, when she was just 16 and has since sold her books to fund community products and projects in the fields of disability, women empowerment, education and environment. Please engage by sending in any questions using the Slido function found in the, ch uh, found in the chat. Uh, Ms. Malambo Nguka, Ms. Tanzila Khan, over to you. I'll be joining you in the second half to run the Q&A, but welcome to Wes. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, Izzy, for such a warm welcome. It is 11 p.m. here right now in Pakistan. It is way past my bedtime, but who wants to sleep? And you know, you'll be having a conversation with Dr. Framzile Malambu, and I'm so excited to be over here. And I think that our names also rhyme, like I'm Tanzila and she's Framzile. So I think that is quite closer. So I feel more at home now. If I can make a formal introduction of myself, my name is Tanzila Khan. I'm an entrepreneur. I have this mobile application by name Girly Things, and we deliver feminine hygiene products to women across Pakistan, along with a lot of advocacy around menstrual health care, cross-cutting with a lot of other issues, economic empowerment definitely being one. As a woman of disability myself, I take it as a gift, and I've been working to create more inclusive spaces among all sectors and making sure that we include everybody that we can whenever we're making decisions. And my passion to write has led me to write two books. And I think there is no stopping over there. I would continue to write stories, publish them, and then also find a stage where I could present them as a public speaker. And of course, introducing Dr. Framzile Malambo. She is United Nations Under Secretary, Secretary General and Executive Director of UN Women. Now in her second term, she was first sworn into office on 19th August 2013 as the head of the UN entity dedicated to gender equality and the empowerment of women. She is a global advocate and has led the organization's innovative work on disruption of society's norms. Through coalition and movement building among leaders global leaders in public and private sectors and with civil society, she is driving the role of women in leadership and ending discrimination and violence against women and girls. Now, before joining UN Women, she served in the Mandela government as Minister of Minerals and Energy and subsequently Deputy President, working on the fight against HIV AIDS and coordinating efforts between the private sector, civil society and government to tackle poverty and education issues. She has also worked as a teacher and has gained international experience as a coordinator at the World of Young Women's Christian Association in Geneva, where she established a global program for, for young women. She is the founder of Mlambo Foundation, I hope I pronounced that correctly, which supports leadership in education. Wow, mashallah, what a diverse profile and what a way forward for all young girls over here to know what to choose for as a career and how to be an advocate. It is such a pleasure to be here with you for this important conversation on gender equality in this critical time, in fact. Um, now, to begin with, I wanted to ask you, why should we be talking about gender equality at an economic summit? Especially now, as the world is struggling to cope with COVID-19 pandemic and looking to rebuild, what does this look like for women and girls? Over to you, Doctor. Thank you very much. And uh, good evening, good morning, uh, good afternoon to everyone who has uh, joined in. And thank you uh, for, for, for having me. It's wonderful uh, to be in this conversation uh, with you. And I'm glad that you could stay up this late. Uh, 
Well, firstly, let me say we are dealing with a health pandemic, an economic pandemic, a social and a political pandemic as well. Uh, every pandemic has a gender dynamic. That is what we've learned from previous pandemic. We've learned that from Ebola. We've learned that from Zika. And every step we take to take correctional measures, we need to have a gender lens. Otherwise, we risk leaving women behind. So when we are addressing um, economic issues, it is actually critical that we take a gender lens so that the solutions that we prescribe address women. Where they were talking about fiscal stimulus, we need to know whose problem are we sol solving? Whose economic crisis are we dealing with? What do men need? What do women need? What does society in, in, in its holistic nature need? Women at this point uh, in time make up two thirds of those who have lost jobs since the crisis began. Women are also uh, in the service sector, which is hardest hit by the, by the crisis. They tend not to be the people who have savings, insurance, jobs with contracts that you can enforce. So not unless in the economic conversation, you actually intend to solve their issues. You could even miss them while you provide generic uh, solutions. Women have also faced a violence, a, an increase in, in violence, especially domestic violence at, at, at this uh, time of uh, crisis and also they have seen the increase on the burden of care. Women are most likely to be uh, already shouldering the already heavy burden in doing the work at home and in looking at long-term solution and creating a new normal. We do not want also to end up with a situation where when we have a change in how we approach the workspace, men will go back to work in the office and women will work at home. So all of what women have gained in the last decades of bringing them into the labor market, even limited as they are, will all be reversed because women will then be sent back to work from home and men will go out and work. So we have to be so deliberate. And that is why it's important that this conversation, we call women and girls by their names. We are not general. Thank you. Uh, I think I'm still struggling with technology. I've been mute, I don't know since how long. And um, while I was listening to you, it's very important to know that um, the, this is just tip of the iceberg. The issues are much more deeper that need to be highlighted. And they were pretty much there even before the pandemic. And because of the pandemic, they have been amplified. For example, for women with disability, especially here in Pakistan, the entire fight was about um, getting access to public spaces and being part of the crowd, being part of the society. And all of a sudden, women have been confined to their homes, uh, whereas women with disabilities were fighting to become part of workplaces all along. So I think we've gone like 10 steps behind and our entire fight, we've gone back to square one. Yeah. Maybe let me just ask you, uh, because women's reproductive needs and rights are just as a uh, critical, have always been more critical uh, at, at this phase. I know that uh, in your work, this is one of the issues that uh, you have been uh, addressing. We also know from our own studies uh, at UN Women and UNDP that women, be, especially women of a childbearing age between the, in their 20s and, and 30s are hardest hit by the pandemic, in part because of reproductive needs. What do you see, um, in, in, in your opinion, as the challenge that uh, creates the biggest gap uh, for women who are entrepreneurs uh, in relation to reproductive rights? That's a very interesting question. And I think very things, uh, it is very much the first startup about reproductive health rights from Pakistan at least. And I know this because in, in the ecosystem, every time I go meet an investor or if I'm in a space where I have to pitch 
as 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 a startup as a business they are they have unheard of any such concept they're like okay your productive health care go to cso go to go to a charity whereas uh, i wanted to emphasize that reproductive health care is like as important as your lifestyle like buying a toothbrush for your oral hygiene or buying a shampoo for for your hair it should be as normalized and talked about and i think companies who are working on it should be presenting to women not in a taboo way but more in an available way and uh, as as you asked i think during this pandemic since we were already delivering these products we realized there's a huge gap between the entire community of women and the services available and the barriers include cultural economic a lot of women they don't have the right technology to pursue the existing solutions that they are we are a country that uh, has a lot of space for development in terms of technology in terms of power in terms of internet and also in terms of devices um 70% of our women are in rural areas yet when they menstruate they need healthy products that are biodegradable but i think we have a long way to go and especially during the pandemic i've realized that we need more sectors to talk about reproductive health care rights it's not a women's issue i think it's the complete family's issue it's the complete society's issue it is a global matter and we need to emphasize on it as much as we can mm well uh, it important uh, to maintain that step but more important to have voices like you who will continue to make sure that uh, these issues do not disappear while people are trying to stay alive and avoid the immense hardship that the pandemic is causing yes we'll keep trying that is the truth okay so i'm just wondering that the themes that you have listed for the action coalitions um it identifies innovation technology as one of the critical areas we also just spoke about it can you speak a bit more about this and why is it so critical right now, especially at this time with the fourth industrial revolution thank you well you know we have a campaign called generation equality Uh, and i i look at you i think this is uh, the the generation equality we are talking about uh, people who are going to take us forward 25 years after the beijing declaration we are creating an intergenerational movement that will take the issues forward and we have grouped the issues into six themes which we call action coalitions and of course you no 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 price for guessing that that will include uh, ending gender based violence it includes uh, economic justice it includes uh, climate change it includes feminist movements and leadership and and the participation of uh, women uh, it includes uh, sexual and reproductive rights and bodily autonomy which we've just discussed and it includes a uh, a uh, technology uh, in terms of you know you know innovation um so why that is important it is because this is the future this is the fourth industrial revolution in which women are underrepresented in the last uh, three industrial revolution we have seen women trailing behind you know, at the earliest state in the first industrial revolution women were not even seen as workers and as it progressed women put uh, just one foot behind where their entrance into the labor force meant unequal pay different conditions of service and, and it has been proceeding like this in the fourth industrial revolution where changes instant like we've seen during the uh, pandemic we were, we went to sleep one night we woke up the other night the world had changed totally uh, we need to make sure that women are part of this fourth industrial revolution as it stands now 70% globally of the internet uh, use uh, is the gap that exists between the usage between men and women we have the, to close the 70 17% gap because it leaves women behind we have 165 million fewer women with mobile gadgets and again as you know this is something that 
women and men need to navigate life in the 21st century. Also, women in the less developed and middle income countries are 23% less likely to use the internet. And as you know, all of these facts mean that women are less likely to have careers in the science and technology field period, in the technology field, which are the fields that are critical for building our economies, impacting on the life, on the life of our, in our communities. It also means that uh, the absence of, of women in these fields means that the, the many jobs that exist, which women need to re, almost reinvest uh, themselves in order to access those jobs, will be inaccessible to women. We estimate that 90% of the jobs in the future will need one or other uh, skills that requires technology. If women don't even have ownership, access and use of the internet, you can just see that uh, it means that we're leaving them behind. And we do need to start at a very early age so that uh, uh, both boys and girls grow up being comfortable to use in the use of technology, that we make them aware also about the dangers and that we actually also instill them the right values so that they are responsible users. And also that we make sure that in the education system, we have the infrastructure that will make sure that those girls who are from rural areas, from poor families, are not being left behind because of their class status. Providing this infrastructure is the responsibility of governments. It is a, a also the responsibility of private sector who benefits from a, a, a country's communities that are technology literate. It means for them, they will get a ready-made workforce, but also it is the responsibility of us as community, because if we are going to have so many people becoming digital natives, we need to make sure that we socialize the space. We make sure that we deal with bullies. We make sure that it is kind space. We make sure that we do not have fake news. In health, for instance, we do know that fake health news does not go victimless. People become victims of choices that harm their health. So women's uh, technology literacy is critical for families, for their own will, well-being, for as well as for their economic development. And we need everybody to play a role in making that uh, possible. Thank that you. Is, thank you so much. And that is so concise. I think you've touched upon very important points. And the numbers, as much as they sound very critical and they worry me at some point, they also excite me because I understand that with technology, the goals that we're, set, that, that we're setting are actually achievable. We can actually do it with the technology that is available to us today. For example, uh, the work that I've done with people with disabilities, I have never worked around pity or seeing them as people who need charity or need jobs. I've always emphasized on them being a huge part of a population, them being workforce, them being given jobs because they can work and they can contribute to the economy of this country and the world. In Pakistan, currently we have around 30 million people with disabilities and that is a huge number. Definitely uh, the ratio of women is more to men, yet men would get access to opportunities because of the cultural, culturally that they have. They can move around. Women have been confined to the house and mostly just expected to get married and have kids. But I think there's more to life. And with technology, we can definitely push forward and bring these opportunities in their own capacity, in whatever way they want. Um, also, as an entrepreneur, I feel that because of me being on the wheelchair, every time I visit a cafe, I have to take someone with me. That means I'm giving the business of two people to that cafe just because they have a ramp installed. I imagine if we have more accessibility in terms of workplaces, in terms of um, any other public space, you're more likely to get crowd to come there and get business. So I think it's generating this entire uh, economy through inclusion. So I think this is the idea that we need to 
that we need to push and uh, with this i'd also like to go to my next question that about generation equality what is being done to ensure it is it truly inclusive i'd also like you to touch on how to move from planning to implementation and concrete action thank you very much i think uh, uh, the issue of inclusion is very important uh, if we think about technology also technology uh, is an enabler when it comes into inclusion it is an enabler for persons with disability so we need to make sure that we actually have this reserved space for persons with uh, disability in the generation uh, equality discourse both young and, and, and old so we are uh, re requesting and engaging with other, whether it is young people, it is the different organizations that we are working out with, as well as the organizations of persons with disability. We are engaged, engaging them as actors in their own right in influencing uh, 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 generation uh, equality. We are hoping that by the time we get to Mexico, which is the first place where we will be announcing actions uh, for generation equality, uh, they would have given us some of the critical areas for uh, that they need generation equality to, to, to address. But I also think that we, we know instinctively that uh, the policy environment has got to make sure that uh, it, it does address the issue of disability so that it is not an add-on, it is embedded in the policy yes, environment that we work with. But beyond dis persons with disability, which as you know, is the largest minority that exists in the world. I think it's about 10% of the people in the yes, world live with one, one form of disability. So this is a huge minority in, 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 in society, which is willing to play its role in society if we remove the barriers. But uh, we have included uh, uh, for the sake of diversification, young people especially, are uh, very much strong. They are included in all the planning and the working of uh, generation equality. Uh, and we have uh, also made sure that we have a space for young people, but also adolescent girls, because sometimes the, need, the needs are slightly different. We are engaging men as well, uh, so that we engage men as, as, as allies, but also men as people we need to engage so that in changing the norms, uh, we direct some of our messages to men who also play a very critical role in perpetuating norms that are harmful to women and girls. We are involving private sector uh, because they also are providers of a, a relief that is critical, but also they also a, 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 a critical component that can bring barriers that can be insurmountable for women. Governments, of course, partners and civil society, women's organizations are also part of a generation equality. Yes, we have had to do a lot of consultation. I, have, I will be the first one to say that I now, I really want us to move into the action space and uh, the intention is that in March in Mexico, we would be then announcing what, is, what are the critical actions that we're going to take in the area of violence against women, for instance. What is the critical, we, we, we say we are not going to do everything in generation equality, but we are going to be identifying catalytic action. We are going to cost those actions. We are going to determine the, uh, the quantum of the change that was going to move. Are we moving to zero tolerance of the particular uh, challenges that we are, we are addressing? Or if it is something we want to see more of, are we moving to universal access? Are we determining that we'll have 15% of ABC by this time? For instance, the adolescent girl with whom I had a consultation last Friday, they were saying to them, one of the most critical a issue for them is universal access to education for girls, which mostly is uh, up to secondary school, as well as ensuring that uh, access to tertiary education is possible for girls 
all over the world, but certainly secondary school must be universally uh, accessible. But, so that means that we have to, in every country, make sure that we provide the infrastructure, the policy environment, the supply of teachers, in order to make sure that girls can stay in, in school for a long time. Girls are calling for the end of force and child marriage. They are saying that we need, and this is the work that we've been doing anyway, we must complete the work of making sure that there is no country that does not have an appropriate age of marriage where you do not have religious leaders and cultural leaders and parents uh, mm -hmm. taking uh, shortcuts and exposing girls to forced uh, marriage and cutting short their school lives. So that is a critical action that we're going to be taking. And we will expect people like you to be part of helping us implement, but also monitoring and demanding accountability and showing that in year one, what have we achieved? In 2022, where are we? In 2023, the idea being that by 2030, we should have a, in a situation where we can show significant change. One of the other uh, critical uh, area, for instance, that has been, that is being um, highlighted is, is on climate change, which is one of the action regions. Um, uh, the uh, climate smart agriculture, for instance, many women are still using the techniques for farming and producing food that are harmful to agriculture, that do not assure them sustainability. Uh, women want to see that through generation equality, we provide both education and means for women to farm, to produce sustainably so that they can preserve and protect their land, but also they can increase the yield in their own farms. So we are able to say in Senegal, because of the intervention of generation equality in 2022, women have moved from producing this amount, this tons of food to these tons of food of rice to the next year. And this is the market that we are identifying with them. Generation equality expects us to be very, very concrete about what we're saying. And of course, generation equality is also about rights. And you know, sometimes rights, you cannot necessarily uh, measure in the same way you can measure when we are talking about goods and, 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 and services. So we need to make sure that in the, uh, in the address of the denial of rights, we need to see the policy, but we also we need consequences when the rights are being denied. So it's going to be a very intense time and the situation has been made much more dire because of the pandemic. We have lost some of the ground that we have covered and we're trying very hard to protect the gains that women made in the last 25 years, especially. Thank you, over. For sharing, uh, Doctor. And I think under your guidance, mentorship, and leadership, we will definitely reach to the milestone, to the goal that we have set. And I am absolutely at your disposal uh, for any initiative that you take as a public speaker, as an entrepreneur, as a disability rights activist, and or just as a woman. So please rest assured of that. And uh, I would like to share that there was one particular event where I really found my voice and that was Beijing plus 20, which took place in Bangkok. And over there for the first time, I realized that I had power among so many women with disabilities. I got a chance to be present, to meet these amazing women, to have a chance to advocate, to negotiate, to speak up for my rights and for so many other women across the world. And I realized that this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I want to have a purposeful life. And now, as you know, that we are now 25 years since the adoption of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action in 1995, but the gaps in gender equality are still quite significant. Is it too ambitious to go is it too ambitious a goal to think we can truly achieve gender equality in this lifetime, where I know that you have a very specific goal and you have kept the strategy quite open-ended. But what are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, definitely it is not too ambitious to dream big. Yes. Uh, I, I actually uh, also encouraged by your generation, which is not afraid of big dreams. 
uh, mm -hmm. which has no tolerance uh, of the deniers of the denial of the of of, of dreams uh, who are a generation that has a radical and refreshing impatience so dreaming big is definitely a, a the thing to do i mean uh, here's the thing uh, when we were in Beijing 25 years ago, uh, consider that we did not have a world that is connected as it is today. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, however, been able over the past 20 years to build a global constituency that fights for gender equality. This constituency now has a shared vision and dream. We have a uh, the sustainable development goals, which permeate and are agreed to by all of our countries. We have a women's movement, young and old, that is connected as never have been before. All of that creates a platform for us to do something that is really big. I say that uh, what is ahead now is for us to jump together at the same time on the same issues so that we can create an earthquake that shakes patriarchy and makes it crumble into pieces that can never be put together again. Now, how do we decide when do we jump? What do we jump for? That is why we have made uh, it our business to have these uh, uh, strainful consultations all over the world on the critical issues around which to jump. These now have crystallized into the six action coalitions and within the action coalitions, the critical issues that we see as the pillars of patriarchy. So that when we say, whether we're in Pakistan, whether we're in South Africa, whether we are, we are in Mexico, whether we are in Chad, whether you are in, uh, in, in Canada, whether you are in Bangladesh, jump together on these issues that are a problem for women all over. We all jump at the same time so that we can feel the collective strength of a global community that is trying to make the change. This is what is going to give us the bold and the big effort to change the world. If we are united on the issue of calling on the frontline workers for ending violence against women to do the most specific things that help to perpetuate violence against women. You call for that in Tanzania, you call for that in Bangladesh, you call for, for, for that in Singapore, you call for that uh, in, in Lesotho, you call for that uh, in Venezuela. We are creating a world where we are actually doing the same thing. I say we all know what a pandemic is. Gender-based violence, it is a shadow pandemic behind mm -hmm. the health pandemic. We know what it means to be a frontline worker working to end a pandemic. It is intense. It needs from head of state to the most grassroots to work and together and to follow protocols that, mm -hmm. we are, that are binding to all of us. We all know that we must wash hands. We all know that we must wear a mask. We all know that we must social distance. There are specific protocols to do with gender-based violence that we must institutionalize globally. And we need the frontline workers for gender equality. These are judges. These are policemen. These are magistrates. These are social workers. These are the people whose work description include protecting of citizens, men and women so that crimes against women are, are prevented and prosecuted appropriately. And they must work around the clock with the same intensity that we've seen them fighting the virus. And this is the big, these are some of the big ideas that we have around calling around the world. Last week, I had a meeting with the police forces of the world, talking about being a frontline worker to end gender-based violence. What does it mean, you know, as a policeman, when a woman presents at the police station, what do you have there, which is a protocol to follow without faith? We want them to speak the same language 
everywhere in the world and to make this a way of life for every woman and for every girl, no matter who they are and no matter where they are. Thank you. Wow, what a refreshingly energizing this conversation has been. And I don't think I'll be able to sleep tonight at all. I think I'll be up all night drafting policies, maybe drafting the protocol and then uh, continuing my studies uh, for my law degree. I signed up for a law degree because now I understand the value of knowledge and the importance of knowing your facts on your fingertips when you're in the presence of such amazing people. Thank you so much. And I'm sure our audience agrees that conversation has really left them and I think the whole idea of jump together will stay with me and I can't wait to do that with everybody. We all will be united and we all will jump together. And with this, I'd like to hand it back to Izzy Baker so we could open the Q&A. Thank you very much to you both. Uh, to you both. It's so great just listening to you, to be honest. I'm feeling very inspired just sat here. Um, but it's brilliant. Uh, we do have a few questions coming in from our audience. First, we'd love to know uh, your opinions on how governments can globally encourage increased participation of women in STEM and entrepreneurships. Don't know who wants to go first. Sure. Okay. Yeah, okay. And, and then maybe you can take the one on entrepreneurship. Let me take the one on STEM so that we can yeah. share the question. Let me just say uh, that uh, it is important that uh, the love of STEM uh, is inculcated at a very early age. That uh, in our schools, from a very early age, we actually expose children both in the careers that uh, education in STEM leads you to, so that uh, they can actually see what they get after that. Uh, we need to make sure that also they see role models, people who look like them, uh, who have achieved careers in STEM. Governments need to have also targets of the number of students that must graduate in STEM and bring about the resources that are needed in order to make that a possibility. Not unless governments are, are planning uh, that uh, 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 investing in that direction, it will not happen automatically. It is about knowing in every school, do you have a laboratory? Do you have the possibility for school, for, for every child to, to, to try their, their, their luck? Do you make sure that some of the STEM subjects are actually compulsory? You don't take girls, for instance, away from STEM subjects, because this is what has happened in some of the schools where teachers would actively discourage girls from STEM subjects. There must be a policy in school that does not make that possible. So more than anything else is to creating an environment where access is possible and access is provided and you will see what girls will do. I completely agree with this point. And someone who's been a very recent student, I completed my bachelor's in 2016. And when I started my mobile application, I did not have a tech background. And I was looking for a female uh, techies. And I looked across and I couldn't find any. So I had to hire a team. They were usually male, males. But what happened was that we had to go through a sensitization program to inform them about menstrual health care. Though to my surprise, they were really supportive but that got me thinking that when I was picking my subjects, what stopped me from picking a subject in STEM? Why didn't I pursue uh, those subjects while giving my exams? And it turns out that Dr. Frimzid is absolutely right. That the environment makes you believe that these subjects are not for you. They're too technical or they're too intelligent for you. And now I continuously encourage my nieces, my nephews, everybody around to pursue STEM equally for both genders, for all genders, in fact. So I think for me, it's more like a bottom to top approach that we need to create an environment where STEM information and opportunities are available. And I think we need to expose our girls to opportunities and learn the environment to ensure that they also pick these subjects and take them as a passion. Excellent. Thank you very much for answering that for us, both of you. Um, and then we've got a, another question here um, asking about the extent to which 
inequalities um, towards women are embedded in the roots of uh, tradition and um, practices. What are your thoughts? Okay, so yes, Dr. Femzile, please go ahead. No, no, please go ahead. Thank you. Okay, so I think my experience as a woman with disability, growing up, I had to experience a lot of inequality, like very generally, like I was always this one person who does not see that the world is there for her. No public spaces are there for her. Even the conversation, I had to literally prove myself that I'm still human, I could be befriended if I'm in school. So for me, my experience with inequality came because of my physical body. And when I grew up, I realized that here in Pakistan, a lot of people believe in segregation. There is a huge inequality when it comes to opportunities. But if you go deeper into it, you realize that that's because not a lot of opportunities are coming from females in itself. For example, we hardly have any investor that's a female here in Pakistan. Now, women do have money, but are they choosing to become investors women entrepreneurs so there's a new conversation going on because a product like mine that is about menstrual health care i mostly I deal with male investors and for them they're not entirely sure about the female problems because of the taboo nature of it and that's when we realize that more women who have power women like myself we need to come forward and become the opportunity providers as well and that's how you change system and making sure that there are equal opportunities available for all genders. For example, as a person who is empowered like myself, if I come forward, there is no way I'm discriminating against anybody. So we need to create more opportunity providers that are feminist, that are sensitized, and that are inclusive right here. Yeah, I mean, if I could just add uh, that uh, culture and tradition uh, is not sacrosanct because we have been sometimes made to believe that uh, culture defines who we are. Uh, culture provides guidance in our society, but also culture is dynamic. It changes with the time. We also need to understand that there cannot be any cultural practice that uh, is more important than the respect of rights of people. So where cultural practices provide uh, norms that are harmful to men and women, those cultural practices need to be changed. The laws of the country need to provide a framework within which those cultural practices will become unacceptable and women and men will be protected from those cultural practices. So the state has a responsibility to address harmful cultural practices. Society, people like us as activists, as policy makers have to make sure that uh, we follow up and make sure that there is both implementation and education in our society. Definitely, definitely. I couldn't agree more with what you just said there. Um, and to sort of lead on from that, talking about the feminist movement in a, in a broader, broader sense, how, what further steps need to be taken to ensure the feminist movement is fully intersectional, do you think? Uh, well, one thing for sure is that uh, young people are leading when it comes into making sure that intersectionality is a way of life. Uh, I mean, uh, just uh, now uh, we know from everything that we've said that disability is not a, 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 a track outside the mainstream. It is an integral part of the struggles that we are fighting. We know that you cannot be a feminist and be homophobic because an equal society where you respect men and women in their diversity and their chosen sexual orientation is a right that is integrated in feminism. You cannot be a feminist and be racist because diversity of races is an integral part of the, femi of the feminism we pursue. So making sure that you do not become a one-track feminist that is only fighting for heterosexual women 
that is only focused on women who are able-bodied, that is only focused on women of a particular race. We have to embody the struggles of all of the people whose rights are being trampled. That is what makes you a true and a dedicated feminist. Absolutely. And I think uh, one thing I'd like to add is that uh, sometimes, you know, as a person with disability, I feel that I am disabled, not because of my wheelchair boundness, but because of the attitudes. And so I understand that there's so many attitudes that are disabling, even if people are fully able-bodied, they have no visible disability or internal disability. At the same time, I feel that for the movement, we don't need to work for females or for any particular community. We need to work with each other and we need to include everybody. It's not a fight about or for women. It's, it's an issue of the society. We need to include men. We need to include trans people. We need to talk to our children about feminism. We need to talk about our parents uh, about feminism. So I think uh, the inclus inclusion begin from the conversation that we're having if we really want to have concrete results. If I could also add to what Tanzila is saying, uh, it is also about uh, making sure that uh, people who do not have a so-called identified notable disability do not regard themselves as having a superiority complex because everybody has something that they do not have. Yeah. Uh, uh, someone may be in a wheelchair. Somebody who's not in a wheelchair may have a disability because of their inability uh, to work with other people, which create a toxic working environment. It is a disability to have no ability to be civil to other people. When you look at the totality of the capacities that are needed to make society works, everyone's talent is actually uh, needed. Some of the best scientists uh, may be on a, a wheelchair or blind. Some of the best musicians uh, who bring joys into our hearts and artists may have a physical impediment, which does not impair them from singing. The fact that you are, you can see, you can hear, does not mean that you can be the best opera singer. So it's also just understanding what we mean by this disability so that we are able to integrate the needs of everybody and respect both the rights and the needs that we all have and not put other people's rights ahead of everyone else because of the way we define uh, their appearance and uh, whatever abilities that they have. We must all acknowledge our shortcomings and respect the strengths that other people bring on the table. Certainly, certainly, yes. And um, Ms. Khan, you mentioned uh, the, the matter of trans women's rights. Uh, we have a question asking you both if you regard the rights of trans men and women as a separate issue. No, that's an interesting question. Yeah. I think this would be the question. If, if I regard, like personally, if I regard the issue of trans men and women or trans women as a separate issue? If you regard the rights of trans men and women, so trans men and trans women as, as separate, separate issues. You know, Izzy, I have to admit one thing that I have had very limited exposure to uh, issues or, or narrative of trans men. So I think it'll be unfair for me to comment on that, though I'm open to it. And of course, being a woman myself, I have more exposure to understand what women go through and what issues they have. But I do have, uh, I have interacted with trans women. In fact, one of them has worked in girly things and she has worked on uh, menstrual health care for a very long time. In fact, she was one of the best things that happened to us. So I do understand that we all integrate somewhere. There is a cross cutting, there is a connection, but I'm afraid I've not really interacted much with trans men, though I'm open to and inshallah I will. Yeah, well, I think in, 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 in general, to the extent that this is a community 
that is discriminated against, uh, whose choices uh, and and uh, lives uh, are in 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 many ways made harder just because of their orientation. Uh, our concern is for anybody whose rights are being uh, uh, trampled upon. We may work more, like me, I work more with uh, trans women because my job is dedicated to women in particular, but I am also just as much in solidarity with trans men. There's many places where we all come together, trans men, trans women, where you, we, we, we come together with uh, gay, just like you deal with gay men, you, you will also deal with uh, lesbian women and you deal with the community as a whole, even though in your mandate, you are dedicated to the service of women. You will not exclude the other parts of that community because they are men. You will include them, even though your mandate, you may dedicate your resources and time more to the other group, not because you do not care about the others, but you will support whoever else is dedicated in their terms of reference to service the needs of that community. Absolutely. Certainly, yes, exactly. And it's like you said earlier when you were talking about how you can't be feminist if you're also racist. I suppose it, the same applies here with, exactly. with the idea that, you know, it's not limited. I mean, often when people are criticizing feminists, they, they cite the fact that, you know, men go through similar, you know, men also suffer from expectations, but it's the whole idea, I guess, I, I don't know if you agree, please let me know about, you know, toxic masculinity is something that the feminist movement would like to get rid of. It's not something it supports men putting other men down. It's all about this idea that we are um, treated with equity. And, 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 and toxic, sorry. Yes, Dr. Simpson. Just to quickly no. add to the conversation that uh, uh, as, as a person with disability and as part of the largest minority, I do understand that the struggles one has when they have to, when they're forced to prove their identity and that narrative. And I think the lack of opportunities over there, the lack of dialogue, I think that is something that is highly uh, required to be given a space to speak and ask and have the voice that one needs. And since I've also worked in theater, I think it is very interesting that once uh, we use theater, we're able to touch upon many taboo issues that otherwise we might not be able to, even in the most sensitized, open and safe spaces. So in that context, we're very much open to ensure that through our work, we're able to give these minorities a space and a voice. Yes, definitely. Miss um, Malambu and Guka, did you have something to add there? Uh, well, just, just to say that uh, it is actually important that all groups that face uh, repression uh, maintain solidarity, that we do not uh, uh, allow a situation where these uh, divisions uh, become inability to collaborate and to coordinate. Uh, and we must state the intention to stand for and with each other. Definitely. Um, so we have a few minutes left. And we do have a question directly uh, for you, Ms. Lamu and Buka. Someone has asked, what was the most challenging situation in your position at UN Women? And as a counterpart to that, do you think that in the new near future, a female UN Secretary General is possible? Yeah. Well, for me, I mean, one of the most difficult uh, situation in the UN for me has been the difference between the rhetoric of support for the women's cause and the limited investment in real money and resources in women's issues. Uh, we see that trend from national where in many countries, the budget that goes to addressing uh, women's programs is very limited and women ministers have to fight for it. And it's almost expected that uh, it is something that donors, for instance, must pay for. While the country may be willing to pay for its own industrial development, 
that it may not be willing to invest in its own women. Uh, when you go into international organization, the amount of resources that are allocated, for instance, for an agency like UN Women compared to anyone else, the amount of resources that are given to women in women peace and security, women who are caught up in war-torn situations compared to the money that goes for military and the defense of peace through the military as against the defense of peace through making sure that the reasons for which people fight, it's chalk and cheese. So the most difficult thing is making sure that those who are with us, the countries that believe in us, the leaders that believe in us show that by putting the money on the table. We'd like, we'd like people to like us, to talk about us, but hey, we like people who pay for the work so that the work can continue, so that no girls can be out of school, no girls can be what, without the, 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 the sanitary uh, uh, provisions that they need, no girl can be without the access to finance for their businesses. These are real things that girl lack. And you, you see some of the resources going the other way. Some countries are willing to pay much more money for their rugby team or cricket team than paying for money to support girls' education. This is scandalous. This is really, really scandalous. So that is my anger and my most challenging time as someone who has to work with nations of the world who are responsible for the public purse. Thank you very much for sharing with us your personal experiences there. It is really fascinating to, uh, to know how you feel about such things and certainly a very passionate matter. Um, we have a few minutes left. I'd love to get from uh, each of you just a few final words to, to the women listening. What, what should we be doing going forward? What, what can we take away from this? Um, I think a youth before age. Oh, come on. We would always need our mentors to be right beside us. So I can't emphasize more on this. And uh, I think uh, the, the, this conversation has highlighted so many points. I have learned so much in just this one hour. And one takeaway that I can tell you that I'm definitely taking away is that to be informed about the global campaigns, the global movement that is happening, it is very important to be in solidarity with women across the world. It's not about my village, it's not about my community or my identity, it's actually a larger movement. And to have a bigger perspective, have a long-term goal, think about the next generation, you could be a 12 year old, a 16 year old person, a 20 year old person, or even a 60, 40 year old person, doesn't matter. To have a holistic perspective, keeping in mind the communities that are across the world and to have a long-term vision. I think that is something that we need to um, As this generation uh, enjoys the thrill of social media and the internet and we want instant gratification, I think it's time we put that aside and start sitting on the table and start taking more important decisions. So as a young person in a semi, uh, I think adult myself because I'm I'm I'm, I'm gonna, like I am 30 now, so I keep questioning myself um, if I'm still youth or should I start mentoring. But I think I'm gonna stick to the youthful part of life. So I'm definitely using this as my power, my energy, my femininity as my power, and going ahead. This is gonna be my takeaway. So I hope uh, you can borrow it. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. And in just maybe 40 seconds. Missing yeah. we're going to get cut off, I'm afraid, soon. Well, firstly, just to say that uh, you are never too young to lead. And we know that, of course, we can see that you are leading, which means that you are ready to mentor uh, somebody and many people and be my mentor too. Because as older people, you, we can be mentored and led by young people because they can see much further than we can see from where we sit now. And the message to young people, for, to, to women, young and old, is that you have to own the space. You, it is your space. You are not intruding in anyone's space. Men do not own the space. This is shared space for both men and women to occupy. Make sure that your presence felt is felt, that your ideas are felt, and that you amplify the voices of those who are not there with you. But it will be wrong for you not to enter the space and not to amplify once you are in the space.